Good evening and welcome to the College of Complexes. Would you please take your seats and uh, let's get this show on the road. Um, the College of Complexes consists of the following format. The first thing we do is we have our speaker who will speak. Then we will have our infamous questions period. Then we will have our rebuttal period. Hi, everyone. Um, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm Jay Becker. I've been here before a couple years ago. Um, and tonight I'm really speaking on the occasion of Inter International Women's Day, March 8th, which was just yesterday. Um, and it's been, I mean, depends on how you count it, but it's been more than 100 years since International Women's Day was first celebrated. Um, there's people here who probably know that history better than I do. Uh, but the observance of March 8th has spread to countries around the world. And in 1965, it even was adopted by the United Nations. So it's got a whole official uh, cast to it. Uh, but in light of that anniversary, I thought it, this would be a good time to assess where women act, where women are at in our ability to play a full role in society and look at the implications for women of the rise of fascist movements and regimes in countries around the world, with a particular emphasis on women's right to control when and if we have children and all that that means for women's role in society. So that's kind of the purview. And in what I'm talking about tonight, Generally, I'm talking about around the world and then specific countries within that. Um, so there's no doubt that women's overall participation in most realms of social life has increased greatly since March 8th first began 100 years ago. And in some areas of life, that, it, that uh, expansion of women's role has been dramatic. At the same time, it's a very mixed bag especially when we look at the direction that that's going in, not just, which is not just all forward. Um, so I'll just give a, a few areas, I can't go into detail, but for instance, education. Primary education for girls has increased dramatically uh, while it's still behind the ed primary education that boys get all over the world. Uh, in some areas, dramatically so, North Africa, South Asia. And while women are completing more post-secondary degrees at a much greater rate than a, even a few decades ago, the gender disparity between the pay of men and women at that level of education is actually increasing. Um, so we have these kind of really contradictory trends. Um, work. Women's participation in the paid labor force has increased dramatically in most of the world, and that has huge implications for women's personal lives, their independence, that they are not entirely dependent on male family members' cash income. But women's participation ha remains much more heavily concentrated in the lower and even the lowest paid rungs of paid employment service, domestic labor, the gig economy, uh, the environment. Uh, half the population in what's called, what he called the developing world, the underdeveloped world, the third world, half of the population in those areas lack access to safe drinking water or readily available fuel for cooking and heating. Half of that population. Who bears the burden of collecting both? women and girls. And then when natural disasters hit, as they are increasingly, they often damage or destroy what access there has been. And again, the burden of making up for that falls overwhelmingly on women and girls to do the backbreaking work to procure the water and the fuel, if it can be done at all. And women's access to employment tends to fall much more drastically after these natural disasters that you read about and see on the paper 
much more drastically than men's does. Again, setting them back even more from their male counterparts. So as we see the environment and the climate crisis growing, that has a very direct effect on women as women, as well as on people. Violence against women around the world, regardless of income, age, or education, women are subjected to physical, sexual, psychological, and economic violence. And violence by intimate partners accounts for the majority of that experience. Its impacts are lasting, including physical, mental, and emotional health problems and death. And those who survive, their ability to work and care for their families and contribute to society can be severely limited by such violence. Okay, on the one hand, laws have been passed against domestic violence in most countries. The majority of women who experience it still do not report it to authorities for fear of ridicule, re-traumatization, failure to prosecute, let alone convict the perpetrators of that violence. So this is one area of reporting where the statistics are uh, blatantly inadequate because of this under-reporting. And the fact that this violence is so is such a ubiquitous global phenomenon is itself a refutation of any exaggerated claims of women's current equality. And then we get to health, especially reproductive health. Uh, here, life expectancy has riven, risen for both sexes in the last several decades. But as we saw in this country, there's been a notable decline of life expectancy for white people without a high school education in the last decade. The same backward direction, I think for similar and different reasons, was noted in the 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the loss of health services by large swaths of the population there. So there's all kinds of factors. It's not just, oh yeah, the next generation is gonna live longer than the last generation. In huge countries of the world, that's true, and in others, it is demonstrably not true. Um, access to birth control and abortion expanded dramatically 50, 40, 30 years ago, and it's now under threat. And it has been for the last several decades in this country and others, with onerous restrictions being put on abortion clinics, and freedom of religion being cited by doctors, pharmacists, and other health care providers to just to refuse birth control and abortion to women who otherwise qualify for it under the law because that offends these health care professional misogynist religious creeds. Now that rationale has been given the United States Supreme Court's stamp of approval in relation to discrimination against gay marriage probably familiar of the, the wedding cake decision. Uh, it's only a matter of time, and not much time, quite likely, before that or some other rationale will be used to further gut, if not overturn, Roe v. Wade, which truly hangs by a thread at this moment. So how does the rise of fascist movements impact this picture for women? What is the fascist program for women? Can you even talk about that? Is there such a thing? While each country has its particularities rooted in their actual, not their mythological history, and current social tensions, there are a number of themes that have been identified by Jason Stanley in his book, How Fascism Works, The Politics of Us and Them, that I'm going to rely on, uh, take from in parts tonight. There's so much here, I'm obviously just going to skirt over a few of the um, uh, themes that he has developed here. And, and just um, as background, the information I was talking about up till now has mainly come from the United Nations statistics on education and work and health. Um, so uh, some of those uh, themes or some of the um, methods <laughs> of fascist movements, one is most importantly the mythic past what we hear, we constantly hear, make America great again. As I'm sure you all know, he didn't invent that. It sounded real good in the original German, uh, the Polish, <laughs> you name it. Um, 
And that mythic past always includes an ideal patriarchal family that in this mythology formed the foundation of the dominant race or culture society. Fascist ideology is a patriarchal ideology. I'm going to read a short passage here. Just fascist opposition to gender studies, for example, flows from its patriarchal ideology. National socialism targeted women's movements and feminism generally. For the Nazis, feminism was a Jewish conspiracy to destroy fertility among Aryan women. Charugupta aptly summarizes the Nazi attitude toward feminist movements. They believed that the women's movement was part of an international Jewish conspiracy to subvert the German family and thus destroy the German race. The movement, it claimed, was encouraging women to assert their economic independence and to neglect their proper task of producing children. It was spreading the feminine, feminine doctrines of pacifism, democracy, and, quote, materialism. By encouraging contraception and abortion and so lowering the birth rate, it was attacking the very existence of the German people. The promotion of these middle, middle Mythic ideals of patriarchal gender roles, are on, that's on the rise globally. Poland is a well-known example where the fascist-dominated legislature voted to abolish even the limited access to abortion that had been established in that heavily Catholic country. And that move was stopped only by massive outpourings of women in the main cities of that country repeatedly until even the fascist party of control had to back off. <laughs> again, from how fascism works. Similar ideas about gender are on the rise globally, including in the United States very often supported with reference to some supposed history. Andrew Auerheimer, <laughs> known as Weave, is a prominent neo-Nazi who ran the fascist online paper, The Daily Stormer, which you might have probably heard of. In May 2017, he published an article in The Daily Stormer entitled, Just What Are Traditional Gender Roles? In it, he claims that women were traditionally regarded as a property in all European co cultures except for Jewish societies and some gypsy groups, which were matrilineal. This is a quote from the Daily Stormer. This was why the Jews were so keen to attack these ideas, because the patrilineal passing of property was innately offensive to their culture. Europe only has this absurd notion of women as independent entities because of the organized subversion by agents of Judaism. <coughs> According to Weave, echoing 20th century Nazism, patriarchal gender roles are central to European history, part of the glorious past of white Europe. And if you think this is only online, just go to the University of Chicago campus where you'll see, see po posters for a movement called Europe, Europa Identity that promotes exactly that ideology and that exact anti-Semitic, anti-women, uh, anti-feminist <laughs> mythology. So don't think it's just some crazies on the internet. It's right here, as well as in power in Washington, D.C. Uh, another another uh, play from the fascist handbook <clears throat> Cultivating a sense of victimhood among dominant sections of the population, such as white people and men. White people generally wildly overestimate the progress that black people have made toward economic equality, which is actually about where it was at the time, relatively at the time of Reconstruction. For every hundred dollars that a white family has in assets, a black family has five dollars. Similarly, men wildly overestimate women's progress towards equality. 
These feelings of loss, of a mythic power that never was, they're not new. But now they are being fueled and weaponized in fascist movements and by fascists in power here and in many countries around the world. Patriarchal, again, patriarchal masculinity sets up men with the expectation that society will allow them the role of sole protectors and providers, and I would add deciders, of their families. In times of extreme economic anxiety, men, already made anxious by a perceived loss of status resulting from increases in gender equality, can easily be thrust into panic by demagoguery directed against sexual minorities. Here, fascist politics intentionally distorts the source of anxiety. A fascist politician has no intention of addressing the real root causes of economic hardship. Fascist politics distort male anxiety, heightened by economic anxiety, into fear that one's own family is under existential threat from those who reject its structure and tradition. Here again, the weapon used in fascist politics is a supposed potential threat of sexual assault. Then he goes on to describe the bathroom bills, right? Where having um, transgender women in the women's bathroom was somehow some uh, uh, source of threat to, uh, to the girls. And so instead, they, were, they are forced to use male bathrooms, which is a real threat to them. All of this bleeds inseparably into anxieties of loss of status due to influx of others, such as Muslims in Myanmar, refugees in Europe, or Mexican, Mexican immigrants in the U.S., who threaten or are framed as a threat to the white male's perception of his desired stratus, status as provider and protector. This unleashes both organized violence against women and lone wolf violence that feels itself vindicated by that mythology spread ceaselessly in modern culture, in popular culture, online and in real life. There are a lot of other hallmarks of fascist policies and rhetoric that I can't go into tonight, but that Jason Stanley has spent the last 10 years of his life analyzing. His, and, and that's uh, encapsulated in this book, which uh, he's a philosopher professor from Yale. This is written for us, for the broad uh, reading public. His last book, uh, several years ago, well, three or four years ago, was called How Propaganda Works. This is an extension of that. That's a lot more of an academic tone. Uh, this is to, as he put it in the New York Times video, if you're not scared about fascism in the U.S., you should be. And this is the book to help you understand why you should be. I'm just trying to cover the key ones that impact the mobilization of fascism against women, against our inequality under the law, against our participation in society, throughout society, and against our autonomy on every level. So the point okay. is not that women are equal, we just have to defend that status. That is deeply untrue. And despite Trump and Pence's war on facts and the truth, it really does matter. What is true, however, is that women's movements for equal rights, and in particular, the right to control when and if we have children through demanding open access to birth control and abortion, those struggles have changed our world and society. They have opened up space for deeper challenges to patriarchy and patriarchal ideology. But we were not able, in the last 50 years, to fundamentally change the substructure of society in which the vast majority of people are trapped in the vice of needing to sell our ability to work at the best or any price and to rely on the family as a source 
of what stability we might be able to find. The family is deeply integrated into class societies as far back as history takes us. And that continues to be true in capitalist societies today. The family is how wealth is passed on. It's the unit within which children are raised that most people still rely on for basic necessities of life. Even as the form of that unit, the combinations of people that constitute a family it, are changing, or have changed dramatically in the last 50 years. Those change, and those changes are part of what's fueling this reactionary male-dominated fascism, the desire to put women back in their place violently. This Ameri and that's where the gender politics, the anti-homosexual, anti-gender, um, gender nonconformity uh, interpenetrates so directly with, with the misogyny and the anti-women politics of fascism. This American fascism has the added feature of its Christian fascist component, which was critical to Trump's rise to power and as represented most powerfully by Mike Pence, they are now determined to get what previous right-wing administrations have failed to deliver to them. And top on that list is ending legal abortions, birth control, sex education, and basic rights for LGBTQ people. That's pretty obvious and pretty direct, and they're moving step by step to, to accomplish all of that. I want to get back to abortion, though, which is, contrary to a lot of Democratic Party um, rhetoric, not an, a wedge issue. Access to it is central to women's... Actually, I have to say this about Bernie, too. His rejection of abortion is a social issue and not an economic issue. It is a very critical economic issue to women. Access to it is central to women's ability to control when and if we have children. And that, in turn, can determine whether you even go to college, whether you can finish high school, whether you can get and hold a job and perhaps advance in a career, whether we can leave an abusive relationship or remain tied year after year, pregnancy after pregnancy, out of fear of not being able to support and thereby risk losing your children. That's why making, and all of that is why making abortion illegal will not end it. It will only end safe abortion. And that too is happening around the world. Abortions are still being performed, but the, the uh, occurrence of complications and deaths associated with them is already on the rise. So, um, another feature that he, goes into somewhat in this book is the fact that um, fascist movements around the world come to power through elections, through normal electoral channels. Whether with examples from Russia, India, Hungary, Turkey, Poland, and other countries where fascists have either risen into the highest offices of the land or made substantial gains in that direction in the past few years. In all of these countries, fascists have gained legitimacy and risen to power through the normal electoral channels. This is a perennial feature, actually, of fascism, as what, including here within the United States. It, and this is a quote from how fascism works. Historically, fascist leaders have often come to power through democratic elections, but their, their commitment to freedom, such as the freedom inherent in the right to vote, tends to end with that victory. This is important for us to confront, and is one reason among many why reliance on the 2020 elections to somehow stop this fascist trajectory of the Trump-Pence regime is a dangerous folly. Once in power, aided by the perceived legitimacy of elections, fascist leaders continue to use fascist politics to consolidate their hold over government and society. Consider the statement made by Michael Cohen, 
just recently in his testimony before Congress, quote, given my experience working for President Trump, I fear that if he loses the election in 2020, there, there will never be a peaceful transition to power. Now, he doesn't have to rely on his own experience. Trump said as much in 2016 during the campaign. He refused ever to state directly that he would recognize the results if Clinton won. And he repeated and has repeated since that the only way he could lose would be through fraud. So now we face a situation in this country where fascists are in control of the executive branch, the judiciary, certainly the Supreme Court, and many layers of the federal courts, and the stronger of the two federal legislative bodies. The Muslim ban has been upheld on terms that make the commander in chief's power over, quote, national security issues almost beyond judicial review and legitimizes the status of all Muslims as threats to American lives. The rights of business to discriminate against gay people have been upheld on the grounds of their freedom of religion, grounds that have already been used to deny women access to birth control at the state level. And Trump just recently instituted what's called the gag rule, that within, I think we're at about 30 or 45 days will begin to deny federal funds to health care facilities that provide any information about abortion, let alone abortion services, even those that are not paid for by federal funds. If you provide any information, which makes their, their um, medical services actually completely unethical because the federal government is denying their health care practitioners the right to give their patients complete uh, information. So how can you have informed consent if the federal, and that's why a gag rule is actually an appropriate name. At the same, as in the, um, the Vice President of Planned Parenthood Action Fund said that this institution of the gag law, it's aimed not only at, at suppressing the right to abortion, they are out to, quote, dismantle the nation's birth control program, end quote. And that has been in the uh, target, uh, the sites of the Christian fascists from day one. All of these anti-abortion groups, every single one is anti-birth control. Meanwhile, the secretaries of education and housing and urban development have both, just to name a couple, have both publicly stated that they won't enforce anti-discrimination regulations, that they are bound by law to enforce. Now, uh, granted, enforcement has often been tepid and uneven at best in the past, but now even the semblance of the rule of law in that arena is thrown out the window to achieve another goal of fascism, I think it pretty universally certain here, of deregulation. And who is going to uh, be uh, disadvantaged by this? Women and minorities. That's who's paying the price. Um, so I, I can only give a few examples. I strongly urge people to get their hands on this book and also it's available as an electronic book. Um, because the, the uh, methodology is real, it's practiced, it's proven itself. He draws the connections not only to Europe and the Nazis, but the history of this country, to slavery and Jim Crow, American eugenics, which the Nazis took as their model, actually. They thought that Jim Crow and American eugenics had gone perhaps a little too far. That's how deep the roots are in this country. So if people feel so confident, or you run into people, or you feel yourself is so confident it can't happen here because of our deep democratic roots, it is happening here. And this will explain why that's true. Now, what does that mean we need to do? What are the stakes for humanity when this Trump-Pence regime, using all the tactics explained in this book controls the government of the United States and what should we do with the knowledge we do have and the reality we're facing. 
We in Refuse Act Fascism think we must act together. Observation is not enough. Outrage is not enough. Without meaningful action, we will be showing the world that we accept this fascist, the fascism this regime is wielding like a giant hammer on immigrants, black and brown people, women, LGBT people, the people of Venezuela right now, group after group that is demonized, locked up, threatened, and killed. If that's not what you want to show the world, come join us in refusefascism.org. Find out what we're about, read our call to action, Charles has some on the back table, I have some, get involved. Most immediately, I really urge everyone here to come on Saturday afternoon, March 23rd, to the Levy Center on, at 300 Dodge Avenue in Evanston. Free parking, completely uh, ADA um, accessible, um, free event. You have a chance to hear uh, Jason Stanley himself, his first appearance with this book in Chicago, to get into these, to ask your questions, to be part of that discussion, followed by a panel that will present alternatives to how are we going to stem this fascist direction. Obviously, Refuse Fascism is going to be one of them. Another speaker who's going to argue that, no, we have to use these democratic institutions to save them. So we're going to have a chance to compare and contrast and get into these really critical uh, his history-making challenges that we face, not just for ourselves, not just for this country, but for humanity and the planet as a whole. As, a, as one person talked about, the climate, uh, the youth and their climate strike they're absolutely right to be doing that, and we have a fascist regime that's pouring fuel on the fire of climate chaos. And that's another uh, urgent reason to come together, to act, to drive them out through massive, nonviolent protests demanding that Trump and Pence must go. Thank you. What? All right. Thank you. All right, next. We have another speaker up here. No. Another speaker. Are you, are you ready? Are you ready to take questions? Oh, is that how it goes? Yeah. Are you ready to take questions? I have to stand up there. Yes. Oh. Okay. You're on. You're on TV. Could I have a? Uh, it's okay. It's been a long time. Okay. Huh? No, we don't have. No, I'm not. No. All right. Need a pen? Yeah. Oh, I might have a pen. You need a pen? Yeah. All right. We're going to have our uh, question and answer speaker speak up. Uh, our question period now. Um, and I would, I since I'm going to be filming. Um, just take a moment. All right. Well, uh, take, you can self-moderate, I take it, can't you? Just pick the people. All right. Well, I don't know who's who. Well, just, just a point of the hand. If somebody can help moderate, it would be much appreciative. <laughs> John, you want to do it? I'm Doug? kidding. Whatever. Doug, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Yeah, 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 go ahead. All right, let's... Is, uh, is the writer going to the people that sponsored Hitler? In Germany, like the Krupps, the Thysons, the IG Farmans, the Junkers, the, the big, the big um, banks and everything, is, is he going to that at all? No, he doesn't. He's analyzing the rhetoric. That's where he comes from. He's a, is a philosophy um, professor. Like I said, his previous book was How Propaganda Works. So he's not giving you that kind of um, in-depth history of Germany. I know what you're talking about. That's very important, but no, he's on another, a different arena there. How to impeach. How to impeach. How to impeach. Um, that's a very big question because the leadership of the Democratic Party, including uh, Jerry Nadler, who's the head of the Justice uh, Committee, which would be the committee to open hearings on impeachment, have adamantly rejected that. Um, I don't think it's going to happen until people are demanding it in the streets, uh, putting 
I don't know how you want to call it, skin in the game, showing that it's not just a matter of, of signing a petition. That's good. You know, what is uh, uh, Steyer? Tom Steyer? Tom Steyer. Tom Steyer, he's up to almost 8 million people have signed the need to impeach uh, um, web uh, statement. And I recommend that for people who say, oh, there's no grounds for impeachment. Go to need to impeach and see. They keep adding grounds for impeachment. There's no question that it's, it, it, well, the it's grounds are there, but there's no uh, willingness on the part of democratic leadership to risk the upheaval, the disorder that that could open up. They are more content to collaborate with these fascists and maintain order than to risk, even if it's fascist order, than to risk um, the unknown. There was a law back in 70 with Nixon. Was a, I, I heard in here there was a law. Nixon was always impeached. If the Democrats made the law that you really can't impeach the president. Yeah, well, the mechanisms is there. It could Can happen. you repeat what she said? Um, that the Democrats passed a law in the 1970s that basically um, vitiated the right to impeachment, the ability to impeach. I don't know about that. that. I think, yeah, I, I don't know. I, 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 I would refer to other legal experts. I think it's a political problem, not a legal problem. Last month, uh, Homeland Security said they stopped uh, 75,000 uh, people at the borders trying to get in this country. And uh, most of them come from Central America, Honduras, uh, Guatemala, which has the highest murder rate, crime rate in the world. These people are coming. I, well, how can you be for that? I mean, I, I don't understand yeah. these people. How could you be for all these? They affect our quality of life. They're going to make us poor. They're going to kill us. I don't. Um, look. This is. The brown people. These are. Yeah, the brown people. The brown these are human people. beings. All the brown people. Be, these are human beings that are uh, <laughs> fighting for their lives. Why are those countries in the shape they're in? Yeah. The United States has a whole lot to do with that. It was the U.S. that funded the uh, death squads, that funded the, the, the genocide against uh, indigenous peoples in Central America, that, that exported its own gang problem back to El Salvador. So we can't sit back here and, and act like we are the innocents somehow being threatened by the invaders. That's again the fascist mentality that we are the victims. Well, we are the victims. <laughs> when in fact the U.S. has been the perpetrator and some of it, a very, very tiny bit, is coming back at, to our borders. And you know what? The U.S. is violating the law every day. Those asylum seekers have rights under international law to come to the border, the only place that they can apply for asylum. They have the right to do that, and the, 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 the despicable Mexican government is cooperating with the United States, denying them their basic right to even apply for asylum. That is a right of every human being on Earth, and the United States has no right to deny that, and we're in violation every day of that right, because they're human beings. They're yeah. mothers and kids. And we're all afraid. We're sissies Does, afraid uh, of mothers and kids. Does fascism see the irony in uh, combating fascism while being founded by a man who believes in one party rule and government control of the media and schools? Are we pussies or what? <laughs> Refuse fascism was initiated by supporters of the Revolutionary Communist Party. If anyone wants to look at what the Revolutionary Communist Party stands for, you can go to revcom.us, where you will find the draft constitution for a socialist republic in America, which is none of what you just said. Yes, it is. It right. argues, it, well, I, We're a I'm answering questions. I'm, I'm answering questions. I thought I was answering questions. You asked a question. Can I answer it? Okay. Um, learning from the lessons of the first attempts at establishing socialism, that draft of the Constitution, which was written by Bob Bacon, establishes freedom of religion. Everyone is free to practice whatever religion they want. The children have to go to public schools where they will be taught 
science, and history and have a common foundation. What they do after school and on the weekends is up to them and their parents, okay? In contrast to mistakes that were made in past social countries. Freedom of the press. In fact, critical government, critical media, media that's critical of the government will be funded because it's so important. Avakian has come to realize that that conflict of, of, of ideas is so important to not just for democracy for its own sake, but arriving at the truth. So that's actually built into that constitution. So it's not anything at all. Previous, the Soviet Union, China, they did have state ideologies of Marxism-Leninism, of communism. That is not in that constitution because you cannot dictate ideology. People have to come to their own conclusions. That's what that draft constitution is based on. So if you want to talk about that, fine. That's not what refused fascism is about. And there's no irony in the breadth of people who are involved in this movement to stop the fascists. And I would like to hear your presentation of how you plan on stopping them. Next yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. You know, uh, well, I think most of America took a deep uh, took sigh, uh, took deep sigh after uh, we uh, neutralized Trump in the uh, last election. Anyway, <laughs> I don't understand abortion. Okay, I don't understand the economics. I don't understand the statistics. I don't understand the politics of it. It seems like it's uh, fake news. It seems like it's uh, a, um, a distraction issue every two years or every four years. I don't get it. There's like, how many, how many, how many abortions are there? Is there a national law? Is how many happen a year? Um, why? Do Republicans just bring it up to have some distracting issue like abortion? No, they don't just bring it up as a distraction. They want to put women back in their place. Why? Okay. Why? Why do Republicans want babies born? Didn't I? I just. I mean, <laughs> it was in the top. I was in the top. It was in the top. <laughs> it's part of this mythological past of patriarchy. Of the, of the male, uh, 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 the father figures, fascist leaders, the leaders are the men. Not that they don't have what female I don't operators. I don't a woman has a baby or not. <coughs> that's fine, you don't. They do. The I, that's what I was reading those do? fascists do. Oh, okay. I, the, in the old days, 10 years ago, there were, I knew Republican women who were adamant supporters of the right to abortion. They're no longer Republicans because that's not allowed in that party. But abortion is central to women's role in society. If you are, are, do not have the right to decide when and if you have children, uh -huh. you cannot decide what you're going to do with your life. Are you going to go to college? I mean, I don't know. You had no sisters. You had no daughters who, like, oh my god, I missed my period. What is going to happen? Because when before abortion was legal and you got pregnant, if you didn't have the money to go to Japan or Mexico, you were shit out of luck, in deep doo-doo. You would be shamed, you would be ostracized, you would be probably shipped across the country to your aunt to hide out while you had some disease or whatever, and then you would come back maybe with a baby, maybe without, and your life was... There's millions of guys that marry, that marry women that have babies. And then you marry some guy that you don't love and you don't want to be with because you're going to have a baby and you Wait, can't support him by yourself. How could someone not love me? <laughs> oh, no, I'm not. Quite quite so I got a question. Wait, you didn't finish. You didn't finish. All right. How many abortions in here are there? I need some questions now. How many abortions are there a year? I don't know. Sure. Sure. How many abortions are there a year? I don't know. How many abortions are there a year? I don't know. Tell me, what is the law? Know. What is this country law? 55 million, million abortions since yeah. 46 years. 55 Charlie, million is dead. 55 Charlie, million abortions. Yes. Yes. Charles, yes. Charles, Charles, please. Okay. Oh so, like a million a year? 55 million. That's oh, like a boom about a million a year. Do your research. Don't tell me. All right. About a million right. a year? Sure. All right. Let's. Uh, uh, all right, Charlie. You, 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 you. you claim that apparently your assertion is that women are equal to men, but history doesn't seem to establish that fact. If you look at the Western world, all the accomplishments have been by men. All the great one second. books have been written by men. All the 
music is the I mean, men, men invented the airplane, the Wright brothers, and then some man invented a rocket. Because and they had a mother that taught them how to do math and to do design. Charles, I'm not even, I'm not even going to I'm not taking, taking the bass. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Madame Curie. Uh, the, mother, the mother of the Wright brothers was the one who taught them how to make designs, how to make industrial designs, and do the math. It was their mother that. And then, uh, has anybody seen the play Photograph 51? No. Yeah. Okay, it's about um, Franklin. Um, a woman who did the lab work and much of the analysis for Watson and Crick. Oh. And she was uh, the person who really describes the double helix. Yeah. But she was. They stole it from her. They stole it from her. And when they got the Nobel for this, they didn't even mention her. Oh, I've heard this. Yeah. No, I mean, the, 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 your point of the actual history, I mean, we probably a lot of people saw um, hidden figures. Sure. And then there's Tico Brahe. Tico Brahe was the person whose data was the basis for Copernicus's understanding of the solar system. And his sister was the one who collected all the data. But she couldn't publish and she put it out under his name. And it, it is true that as women are, are getting some access to education, the percentage of women in the STEM fields is rising rapidly. But their, the inequality of their pay remains. So to say that this is some kind of, you know, any contention that this is some kind of biological function is disproved from dozens of angles. Give me so, another question. I okay, you. one more. All right, <laughs> seriously. I've read many issues of Der Schegel, and the women in fascist Germany were treated very nicely. Oh, as opposed to the Soviet Union, where they were expected to work in munitions factories, pick up weapons and fight in the forest, fly planes or tanks, drive trains. Um, the women in, in German versus Germany were not mistreated. Um, I would recommend a book called Mothers in the Fatherland by Claudia Kunz. She's an American historian of modern Germany. Uh, it's a, a chilling book. I reread it after Trump was elected. It read really differently than 10 years ago. Um, but she analyzes how the, the Nazis systematically went after all women's organizations, not only the feminist, um, the women's, like the equivalent of the Bridge Club, the PTAs, were all systematically first um, what they call Gleichschaltung. They had to be uh, made to conform to Nazi uh, yeah, precepts. Coordinated. Coordinated would be one way. Um, and one major part of that was no Jews allowed. So Jewish women were not treated so good in Nazi Germany. So who women are we talking about here? Uh, not to mention uh, uh, Roma and Sinti, uh, people with disabilities of all sorts, all of those women were not treated well at all. And the, 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 um, you're, you're right to the extent that uh, German women were uh, forced out of the workplace, whether they wanted to or not. Many of them did not want to. Weimar Germany, women were making huge strides. Uh, abortion and birth control were readily available. It was some of the most advanced um, uh, in, in that way in the world, um, and they were all slammed back into, uh, into the closet, into the home, into isolation, when, and, and many of them did not want it at all. Um, so that's not what I call good. On the other hand, the Soviet Union did, uh, from the beginning, put a lot of effort into educating everyone, especially not only, but especially women. They went from single-digit literacy to almost 100% literacy in a generation and a half. And when you, when you can't read, well, how can you participate in anything? So this opened up enormous doors for women. 
And yes, they did mobilize the whole population against uh, Nazi Germany. Um, and, and they did that on, on a nationalist basis. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, a, a good thing. It, it really undermined uh, the future of that revolution. But I think there's no need to apologize for the fact that women were completely a part of that effort to defend their country and their revolution. I have several men friends of mine who've commented with the rise of the Me Too movement, women's liberation, and everything else, that they are so scared to say anything at the workplace anymore that they do not actively engage in any relationship with women. Uh, one guy wanted to mentor a woman, but he was told, no, all she has to do is bring up an accusation and your career will be over. So don't go there. Welcome to the club. <laughs> well, then you got all the perverts to thank for that. And you know, the thing is, <laughs> is that, um, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe it might be welcome to the club for you, but the thing is, is that the whole tone of the workplace, even some of the women who are there, they said they, they know them from previous jobs, just can't say anything. They cannot make friends. They cannot do anything. All in because of fear of an unfounded accusation. You know, honestly, if men don't know how to behave like adults to women, then they should learn. I, I have, honestly, I have no sympathy. Women have put up with harassment in the workplace since I had my first job when I was 15 years old. Enough. More power to the Me Too movement, and with men Yeah, I'm with the Me okay? Too. There's too many pervert guys. Take it away, Jim. <laughs> I, I wanted to talk about, uh, about the amazing... Yeah, a comment. Remember, this is... We'll have our rebuttals yeah. after questions. Question. I, I wanted a question. Oh. Well, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get you we'll up there during the rebuttal here. period. Okay. <laughs> what the hell is the abortion law? Okay. Um, any more questions? Anyone who hasn't had a question. Yeah. I, I didn't give him one of my questions. Question. I, I would like to ask a question. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Sure. You asked enough questions as it was. Nice. I only got I one. Watch, shut, shut up. Wait. David, I, please. I wonder if anybody here have witnessed in the workplace, in the workplace, abuses of women by foremen and other people. Oh, my God, yes, I Oh, have. yeah, I have. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of pervert guys. I've oh, also... How many? Uh, plenty. Uh, one, two, three, I did, but I, I wouldn't... Oh, yeah. Uh, how about the reverse? <laughs> That's not a mythology myth. Um, so, no, and then, Jonathan, <laughs> John, did you have a question? Uh, Recently, we've heard from uh, the likes of uh, Elliot Abrams and Mike Pompeo and Marco Rubio, Kiss Mike answers. Pence, that uh, <laughs> Venezuela is the most dangerous threat to all Americans' lives ever since Orson Welles' radio broadcast of Bora of the World. Uh, isn't it the case that the only threat the sovereign country of Venezuela, a friendly neighbor to we the people of the U.S., is the threat of a good example of how to end poverty, especially in the lives of women? <laughs> That's kind of a setup. <laughs> um, Give you a fastball it's a yes or no. I, I think that Venezuela poses no threat to anyone in this country, any people of this country. Absolutely not. It poses a um, you know low-hanging fruit that these these war criminals that you listed want to harvest, absolutely. And they're whipping up these outrageous claims that, of its, you know, socialism gone awry and, and, and uh, the, the, the progressive Democrats want to turn the U.S. into Venezuela and every kind of, well, and then who was it? Um, Bolton said that either, what he said, uh, tweeted that Maduro had two choices. He could either um, retire to a life on the beach or he, Bolton, would see that he ended up in Guantanamo. This is who these people are. And uh, Marco Rubio is um, making jokes about the, where are we at now, 30, 40 hours of no power in Venezuela. Who knows who's behind that? But to revel in those people's difficulties, real hardships, 
is sick. And that is the kind of fascist mentality. We should celebrate that these people are having a, a difficult time. Again, fueled in no small part by the U.S. No. And this hypocritical uh, cry for humanitarian aid, which frankly, Bernie was on that tip for a while. He's gotten off it, thank goodness. But uh, join in, we send humanitarian aid. Well, it's the sanctions that the U.S. put down that are causing a major part of those difficulties. So, uh, yeah, that fits completely in the fascist playbook. I mean, you could, you could substitute Poland in 1939 and change the script around and it'd be the same thing. And who knows what they're going to do with it. It's very, very dangerous. Um, okay. Some of my best friends are men, and less than three quarters of them are uh, male chauvinists. Less than three quarters. <laughs> Yay, we're making progress. Um, I think everybody else has had a question. I didn't get my order. What's the law on abortion? Is it uniform across the no, country? No. Not at all. It's state to state. Illinois is becoming an island of abortion rights. Uh, Prisker has already signed in some. I, I can't run it all. So everybody's got different laws. Right. It's very different. There are, what is it, six states that have one abortion clinic left? Eight. So far, eight. Is there eight? God, it keeps growing. It's really, and who, really deep. What's the demographics? Is it mostly Some just young women, women or black women? No, most women who have abortions women. have already had a child. Um, many of them, I don't know if it's still current, but many of them are married. Uh, it's all ages, all classes. Uh, really, uh, what is it? One in three women will have an abortion during her life. You look around in your circle, there are women who have had abortions, almost certainly. So it's it's your neighbor, it's your uh, aunt, it's your cousin. Those are I'm that's who's having abortions. So I'm off. Right, you you have three I, questions already. I have one, I have one oh, question. Oh, okay. Um, Jay, you know, we, we all know we need more people in the streets. I only got two This great evil yeah, that's uh, this great evil that is uh, this shadow that's um, come over our country, and women were a great part of that with the two first women's marches, but then it petered out this last January. There was no great outsurging of women's <laughs> protests, especially with this terrible uh, dilemma of what's happening with uh, abortion rights, possible revoking of Roe versus Wade, which possibly they're holding back from because they do fear it. But what do we need to get women mobilized again? Uh, that's a great question, and I uh, all input on the answer is welcome. Um, in that sense, uh, you're right, the, the first two women's marches were tremendously important. Uh, I was sorry that the first one came the day after the inauguration. I think it would have been much more powerful and dramatic if it had been up against the inauguration. But still, it set a tone of, 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 of resistance, of rejection against this regime that was really important. I think mainly um, the organizers that call or don't call that make that happen have bought into the blue wave that we're going to elect our way out of this um, and that was certainly the case here in, in uh, Chicago that the Chicago Women's March um, instead of marching in January marched in October and it was the march to the polls for the November um, so it turned the women's movement into an electoral uh, campaign, which is the opposite of the women's movements that have accomplished so much in the past, from the suffragists to the second wave. We were not about electing anybody. We were about demanding our rights and not quitting until we did. And we need that spirit of demanding that this Trump-Pence regime must go and not quitting until, uh, until it does. And that was the point that I read from how fascism works, that fascist regimes can be elected, they usually are. And they prefer because it gives them an aura of legitimacy. As soon as they have power, they start dismantling the means by which they could be driven out of power. I didn't even get into a tiny sliver of that. Uh, gerrymandering, voter suppression, um, the power grabs that you saw in Wisconsin, in uh, Michigan, in North Carolina, Stacey Abrams, the vote was stolen from her, okay? And what did the Democrats do? Filed a damn lawsuit. 
going to the same courts that Trump has packed. Okay? That is not, there's no exit sign there, people. We have to go into the streets. That's, and we have to make that case. It's on all of us who understand That's fascism. That. So, so. Yeah, hell, it isn't. What do you know about uh, the Thank you. I guess uh, so. Can we so take, take one, let me take one more question oh. from this gentleman, please. I've already had three from him. I only had one question. Yeah. Let him, let him go. Let's ask one last one. Yeah. Okay, here's the, here's the thing. In my research, I read that 55 million uh, right. abortions were done in the past 46 years. 55 million little babies killed. They're okay. Little babies. Actually, I'm pro-abortion. Actually, I'm pro-abortion. Okay. And 55 uh, million babies. women were saved from okay. a life of... Okay. No, many of them don't have... <laughs> anyway, anyway... They're zygots or the, fetuses. They're not babies. The uh, uh, Fifth They're and fetuses. the Fourteenth Amendment... Let him speak. No state can deprive any person of life, liberty, this or person. property without due process of law. Yourself. Did these babies get due process? They were deprived They're of their life. Roe versus Wade is argument. unconstitutional. You don't you have to listen to that. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to point to the danger of that logic. We're seeing it right now. What I, I, I forgot the state. Where is it? Is it Oklahoma, Missouri? Where a judge has allowed a lawsuit by a man on behalf of a, a zygote that was aborted. The judge has given that aborted fetus personhood, and that man is suing a woman for a, her abortion. That is, and if that is going to end our right to birth control, okay? Because the same logic applies to birth control. And there are not babies, as we, what's that old one? Um, not babies in Only God knows what they are. All right. Only God knows this is right. Temporary. It's one of these issues oh, that... A, fetus is a, fe a baby's not a baby till it comes out. That's what birthdays are all about. All right. All right. Let's go to rebuttals now. Let's go to rebuttals. Thank our speaker. All right. You want to count out and uh, I'm, I'm gonna. You're gonna ask me a question. I'm gonna go first. All right. No, no. Before we start rebuttals, let's find out how many we got. Make a count, please. Oh my God. <laughs> it's always three minutes. What are you? <laughs> Sometimes three or four. All right, we'll go. Uh, Five minutes. We can go. We, we can go four minutes. Well, we're at seven thirty. The amount of rebutters. We'll st we can start at maybe four minutes, five minutes. Okay. It's uh, seven thirty-three. We'll go about five minutes each. And if you want to go first, uh, let me get a time timer up here. We'll get started in a second, please. Boys should be boys and girls should be I have nothing against what I have not. I'm, I'm all for women's liberation as long as they stay at home to cook and clean. Oh. And Archie Bunker. Archie Bunker. You had to dig back to the past there. Yeah, you and John Wayne. <laughs> okay, give me a second to get an online timer. Women are not confused. All right, give me a second here, please. All right, we're going to go about five minutes a piece. That doesn't mean you have to use them all, but we should have enough time for our rebutting. So if you can get a chance here, we're going to start and go ahead. Well, you can tell Jay is a very accomplished speaker, and uh, she really has her facts together. Um, I'm uh, also amazed at how well she handled the question. So I agree with almost everything she said. Uh, the uh, the uh, fact is that um, uh, women's rights have been pushed back in this country uh, with the uh, victories of uh, these uh, Republicans. It, it always has amazed me how they uh, fed on the gullibility of people. Um, for the most part, uh, Republicans ought to know that um, uh, people who are uh, underprivileged uh, economically are the ones that are, it's hardest for them to get abortions, but amongst their Republican rich followers, they can get abortions fairly easily because they can pay to go to a state where it's available or a country where it's available. And back before Roe really v. Wade, they just, you know, flew to Sweden or something. And they, so the rich people actually um, 
were, uh, uh, by denying abortions to the poor, they were undercutting their future uh, as a party because they were providing for more Democrats to be born. That is a logical and cynical argument, I guess you could say. But it always amazed me that they uh, did this because they only saw their ability to um, fool the people with this uh, crystal fascist kind of thing where they would um, use a divide and conquer strategy. They'd, they'd get the evangelicals on board with them. And Reagan was the one who really went on board with that. And uh, those of you can, that can remember, I'm old enough to, um, how Reagan took, managed to get, um, uh, by getting disenfranchised Democrats that thought somehow um, uh, they would have a better uh, economy under Reagan. And um, these evangelicals who were um, uh, co-opted into this um, anti-abortion thing to where it was a, um, a religion of its own, um, a kind of a crazy uh, mentality. Um, nothing in the Bible indicates that uh, abortion uh, is something that um, uh, is anathema to God or anything of like that nature. Um, and uh, Jesus says nothing about abortion. But uh, these Republicans um, took it as a mantra. Uh, they've been able to convince these gullible people, so they are able to eke out victories in elections that are close by suppressing the votes of people who would normally vote Democrat. And we, we, we talked about that before. Um, but um, the focus of this talk, of course, wasn't just about um, pushing back on abortion rights and the oppression of women. Um, and it is oppression. It absolutely is, as Jay's pointed out, for somebody, um, a woman that has this um, anxiety about um, should she have a child or not. She shouldn't have to be put through that. I mean, uh, birth control should be available to everybody. It probably should be available free. Um, I, I would go along with that uh, in, in a heartbeat uh, as a legislative uh, uh, thing if we had Medicare for all. Uh, <clears throat> that people shouldn't be able to impose what is definitely a religious opinion that has no basis in facts, impose that on other people. That's the nature of tyranny. We're talking about oppression and tyranny here for those that would do that. And they are crystal fascists. So that's a part of her talk. It's a very important part. Um, the other important part of her talk was revealing about uh, how fascism hit, is spreading in, over the world, uh, how it has spread here, um, the, the things that they do, as, as are brought up in uh, Mr. Stanley's book, which will be discussed on the 23rd, and she was plugging that. <laughs> I tried to plug it in my own way at the beginning. But um, um, you got the uh, flyer about uh, it's. Um, in Evanston at 1 p.m. on the 23rd. And we just all have to be um, alert to all of these lies and deceptions that these fascists use to try to um, put a wedge in, to try to uh, convince people that, uh, oh, it's normal, and as they make a step one more step in the direction of uh, pushing back against the free press or pushing back against people's uh, right to demonstrate. And we have to really be on the lookout for whatever events are going to occur that we are going to have to... Okay, five minutes. My five minutes are up. The so events that we're going we're to have to do to both um, uh, keep rights for women and keep rights for all. Okay? All right. Oh, I have. Oh, it's not. Oh, this off? No. Now what? Okay. Hello. Uh-oh. Hello. Hello. Is that happening? Oh, what's oh, going Andy. on? Oh, Andy. Hello? Is there an electrician in the house? Well, I had, I had three things I wanted to bring up. Uh, hello? Oh, there we are. Uh, I had three things I wanted to bring up. Uh, if you want to be really uh, abused by something, you could go online and look for the song, I'm Moving to Arizona. It's by a young woman who plays the guitar and she very, seems very understated. And, the, and it basically happened when um, uh, um, 
Something happened in Arizona where every woman between a certain age was considered to be pregnant. And I, it was some law that was passed there. And she wrote a song called, I'm moving to Arizona because in Arizona, I'm pregnant. And it was a really, it's a really, really funny, interesting thing that you can look up online. You can just ask for it. And the second thing I wanted to mention is something that I did <clears throat> when we were standing out in front of clinics and hospitals. I made a sign which I intended to be ironic and the sign just said citizenship for zygotes. <laughs> and I was thinking that was a joke. And uh, I was trying to show the antis uh, what happens when you know, their logic is, le when their thinking is led to a logical conclusion. And I was standing next to an anti and she said to me, I think that's a very good idea. She, without irony, she said that. And I just thought, well, then any woman who's pregnant should be able to vote twice. So if you're pregnant, you get two, you get two votes instead of one. Um, what? And then the last thing I wanted to mention was, uh, if you watched Kavanaugh, the day after he was accused, standing up in public and crying with that red face and claiming he was such a, he was being so victimized. And I, you know, it, it was a phenomenon to see that man great example. Uh, yeah. of, being, of being just, you, you know, you, you could turn him from a victor into a victim in two hours. Yeah. And he's suddenly there crying and, and asking for his rights. And I thought that was pretty much of a phenomenon until I saw R. Kelly do exactly the same thing. Yep. Yep. R. Kelly did exactly the same thing. He's standing there crying and complaining that he's been victimized, that he didn't do these things. And, you know, it, it, it was just two parallel things. They were so much the same. I, you can't say they're exactly the same, but my reaction to them was exactly the same. Kavanaugh's getting a full-time forever job. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, but R. Kelly is going to go to jail. Yeah. Kavanaugh's gotten yeah. a lifetime job, but right. it's probably about 150000 a year. Yeah. Both creeps. <laughs> All right. Well, why did, I just want to say that um, I'm a conservative, but I'm pro-abortion. I believe women should have the right to their own body, you know, if they, they want to have an abortion, it's got to be legal, but... Uh, okay, the, and, um, the, the Democrats are concerned about the 5-4 uh, majority in, in, the, in the Supreme Court. They're afraid... <coughs> They're afraid Roe Ro versus Wade is going to be overturned. No, we're afraid of more and, uh, than that. <laughs> the other thing, I've got, these are observations. I, I, I am pro-abortion, but the, these are observations I, I, I made while I uh, the, about the uh, stop, stop uh, the t taxpayers sh should not fund uh, abortion, f family planning for programs. They, they should not because that. A lot of them are against it. Well, why should they f fund this? And it, it's, uh, it, it's unconstitutional also. And uh, the, now the biggest thing is this D&E, d, &E, d &E, dilation and evacuation. Well, they suck the uh, amniotic fluid oh. out from the baby oh. when they're committing I'm an abortion. Eating. Hey, we'd be quiet. Well, I'm eating. And uh, <laughs> they put cl clamps in there and tear the baby out of the uh, oh, uterus. Sometimes they'll tear a leg, an arm, and, so, and some, a lot of times the baby is, the baby is still alive and they're, with these clamps they insert in there and uh, it's a violence, a heinous, heinous violence, especially if it's a live cycle. Okay, now okay. The, the largest abortion <laughs> provider, Planned Parenthood, is in the business of selling Baby tissue. They take this Fake tissue news. and they sell it. They sell it. It was on 60 Minutes. Don't you watch 60 Minutes? Fake news. Okay, uh, pro-choice pro advocates mislead the Amer American public. They say they commit uh, abortion uh, to, 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 say, to uh, 
for, for the life or, or to, to uh, save the life or, 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 or death of the mother. Everybody speak. But this is a rarity. This is a rarity where the mother, maybe in the third world, the, the mother's life at stake, but in this country, with all our medical advances, the, 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 the mother is not in danger of, uh, very, very rare in my research, what I'm reading. And uh, the, the Democrats in Vermont are attempting to pass a bill to make abortion, abortion entirely, in, in the entirety of the, the pregnant period. For the, for the whole nine months that they can c commit abortion at any time. And uh, the, um, the, 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 the fetus is a, is a person. If the fetus is a person, then it is protected from abortion by the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments. They, they say that the unborn is, is, are not persons. And that's how they got around this, and they passed this in 1973, Roe versus Wade. Now, Doe, Doe versus Bolton, at the same time as Roe versus Wade was passed, they said that uh, the health of the mother can also mean physical, mental, psychological, emotional, or age of the mother. You can have abort the, the child for those reasons. Not for the imminent death of the mother, but for... for for age of the mother, emotional health, I mean, what is this? That they could commit an abortion for that? And now, uh, Roe versus Wade, Wade for 46 years, which I mentioned before, 55 million zygotes, if you want to call them that, I call them potential babies, were snuffed out, 55 million. Now, the 5th and 14th Amendment, I read it before, no state can deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. These zygotes didn't, didn't have any due process. Their life was snuffed out. God knows. I believe that Roe versus Wade is unconstitutional. I think you got something to fear. If it comes up again, the Supreme Court will probably, we got a five to four conservative. But I'm, I'm actually, uh, pro pro abortion, but not for these fr frivolous reasons like like uh, emotional or whatever age of the well, age of the mother, but it's got to be for good reason. Abortions. Okay. Yeah. Well, all, all right. Next. Fifty different laws and fifty different states. Who decides it's a good reason? Yeah. <laughs> God. Okay. Got it. How many people heard of Elsa Clark? <laughs> Who? Elsa Clark. In Germany, she was a fascist, and what she done, she takes skin of people that were put in the concentration camps and made lampshades out of them. You know who she is? She's a relative of the Koch brothers. So fascism is in the family of the Koch brothers. Another thing, after the Second World War, the first fascist that we uh, recognized was Franco. And, and why do we recognize him? Because the United States was very anti-communist. So he was anti-communist. That's why I recognized him. If you look at Latin America, they had the School of Americas where they taught these people how to torture people, how to butcher them, how to set them afire, all kinds of torture in Latin America. If you go to uh, Chile, you had Pinochet, he was a fascist, and the United States recognized him right away. If you went to Argentina, you had the Junta there. The Junta threw about 30 million, 30,000 people from planes into the sea to kill them. And then they took the babies from the ones they killed and they had them adopted by their own people. The United States has been uh, recogni recognizing fascism for well over a hundred years. It supported Batista. Any dictator in Latin America, there was Rio Mont in, I think, uh, in uh, Guatemala. He killed about a hundred thousand people. He was a fascist. Columbia had fascism. 
all over Latin America. Uh, if you went to Greece, the United States sponsored the junta there, that was fascist. It's got a very long history of supporting fascism. And if you think that fascism can't be brought here, you're living in a dream world. In fact, in about 1910 or so, uh, uh, what's it? Jack London wrote a book, The Iron Heel. The Iron Heel was about fascism coming to the United States. And who sponsors fascism? It's the capitalists, the industrialists, the bankers, the, 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 the latifunda, the landed uh, state people in Latin America, the Junkers in Japan, in Germany sponsors, they were, they were sponsoring Hitler. Hitler never would have come to power if it wasn't for the bankers and the industrialists in Germany. They wanted to stop, not only wanted to stop uh, communism, they wanted to go to war because Germany didn't have any colonies. The United States, Britain had so many colonies. England had India, the United States had all of Latin America, and Germany wanted to get colonies so it could breathe, so, so to speak. It could expand like every other imperialist country. If you have an imperialist country, eventually, when their back is to the wall, they'll impose fascism. Thank you, Jay. Glad you spoke this evening. Okay. Bertrand Russell once said, most of the greatest evils that uh, humanity has inflicted upon humanity have come through people feeling quite certain about something which, in fact, is false. Fear is the main source of superstition and one of the main sources of cruelty. To conquer fear is the beginning of wisdom. Collective fear stimulates herd instinct and tends to produce ferocity towards those who are not regarded as members of the herd. To demand for certainty is one which is natural to humanity but is nevertheless an intellectual vice. So long as men are not trained to withhold judgment in the absence of evidence, they will be led astray by cocksure prophets, and it is likely that their leaders will be either ignorant fanatics or dishonest charlatans. To endure uncertainty is difficult, but so are most of the other virtues. So we're in a country right now uh, where the highest levels of power, wealth, and influence are uh, ignorant fanatics and dishonest charlatans. So that quote's uh, very timely. Uh, here's some of the warning signs that we've had for decades. Powerful and continuing nationalism, disdain for human rights, identification of enemies as a unifying cause, supremacy of the military, rampant misogyny, controlled mass media, obsession with national security, religion and government intertwined, corporate power protected, labor power suppressed, disdain for intellectuals, disdain for the arts, obsession with crime and punishment, rampant cronyism, rampant corruption, fraudulent elections, denial that pollution is real, and especially denial that climate change is destroying the environment. <coughs> Absolute lack of respect for the disability community and independent living movement. So we're in a country right now that uh, we the people's values and it the money's policies are on extreme other ends of the spectrum. And uh, there's that old saying, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The enemy of my enemy is my ally. The enemy of my enemy is the person who I lock arms with. We can't afford to have an ideological purity test at this point in time in history. We can't afford to have an ideological <laughs> litmus Thank test. You. We're going to have to find uh, radical solidarity with those that in the past uh, we've had strong disagreements with, but we see that survival of the species, survival of equality, and the survival of our human uh, 
community is under threat. We're not trillionaires, not billionaires, not millionaires, not thousandaires, not hundredaires, not dollar heirs, no, not even penny heirs, because soul heirs, soul heirs are we. Soul heirs, soul heirs are you and me. We the people are ready, because soul heirs, soul heirs are we. So that mountain of money who thinks his joke's so funny, who thinks his kiss is honey, who thinks that hate is so lovely, that cauldron of nothing, who claims that wars ain't bloody, who claims that rape's so studly, and that ecocide is so sunny, that billionaire ain't got nothing on you and me. That plutocracy, oligarchy of greed, those billions ain't nothing like we. That collapsing from within vampires casino street, because soul heirs, soul heirs are we. We the people, we the peeps, are ready. And a new day is as close as our will to be free. It's another world and a Mother Earth community. Because soul heirs, soul heirs are we. Thank you, Jay. May I go next? May I go next? Thank you. After you're done, may I go next? That's all right, I'll go after Margaret. Let me remind everybody again, the Refuse Fascism is a creation of the Revolutionary Communist Party. Oh. <laughs> While I am sure there are folks who are genuine in their opposition to fascism who are involved in, in the organization, I implore those folks to disassociate and start their own organization that stands opposed to not only fascism, but other forms of authoritarianism like the Revolutionary Communist Party. <laughs> now, abortion is a very explosive topic, and I believe that people on uh, all sides of the issue can come to their points of view in good faith. Not all anti-abortion folks are Christians or misogynists or idiots or fascists or gullible, uh, as I've heard this evening. And not all pro-abortion pro -abortion folks are Satanists or whatever label. Uh, many women are actually anti-abortion as well, and thus no consensus among women on the issue. There is also a contentious, this is also a contentious issue among libertarians. The LP position is that the state stays out of the matter. It's the choice of the woman. This also means libertarians would be opposed to taxpayer-funded abortions. Now, I want to recommend some of my favorite women thinkers. Hope you guys can check them out. Uh, Ayn Rand. I'd recommend. <laughs> Camille Paglia is a very good uh, thinker. Oh, <laughs> Ian Hersey Ali, um, another good woman thinker that you all should check out. I also want to give a shout out to my mom and my sisters, some of the strongest women I know, and they're also anti-abortion. Now my body, my choice, right? Who asked me to cut off my foreskin? No one. So, uh, you know, that seems kind of crazy. My body, my choice, why I have to register for the draft? I don't know. Uh, my body, my choice. You know who also uh, forces people to register for the draft? Uh, uh, the Constitution for the New Socialist America talks about drafting people. So, uh, but I'll just end right there. Thanks. Okay. Right. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. So this Bob Avakian uh, thing, uh, this talk, I think I'm going to go. Uh, just curious, does revolutionary books pay a living wage? Does anybody know? It closed three years ago. Oh, bummer. And <laughs> <laughs> Rand, that says it all. Thank you. Okay. She's a great woman thinker. <laughs> you disagree, Margaret. you're sexist. Margaret. <laughs> go for it, Margaret. Yeah, I'm sexist, all right. All right. Um, You're sexist too. Huh? Yeah. Uh, so he's obviously kept up with things. So um, first, I'd like to talk about medical terminology. It's really obvious that some people don't have a good grasp of it. A zygote is an is the, the the cell contribution from the male or female, which is not a living organism in and of itself, and does not have any ability to reproduce itself itself it's only if it's joined with the zygote of the opposite sex that it creates a um, and uh, basically first it creates the fertilized egg and then it creates what's called a blastula which is a hollow 
uh, ball of cells and then it uh, becomes an embryo and it actually the blastula then implants in the wall of the uterus and then it becomes develops to be an embryo until and, and the uh, medical embryological point at which the embryo turns into a fetus is when the, the, the cartilage specimen, uh, I'm sorry, the cartilage skeleton is already kind of laid down the general forms of it and it start, starts to ossify or starts to become bones and that's when it becomes a fetus and that's that is at, at a, like nine to, it, it depends on which dating methods you're using, but something, let's say, 10 weeks. Now, when you talk about how old the embryo fetus is, you have to say whether you're judging it from the woman's last period, which actually the, uh, the egg was fertilized two, two weeks after, in general. That's a generalization, two weeks after the woman's last period. So the, uh, if you're talking about the woman, I'm sorry, it was fertile, yeah, that's right. right. So if you're talking about the, the last, um, the date of the last period, and that's your guideline, that's really two weeks before the woman was pregnant. So, um, so you know, the terminology is kind of important. Uh, third trimester abortions are not legal in any state in this country. And a third trimester, this, the pregnancy of the, ni of the nine months is, di is, is divided into three month, essentially three month uh, periods, first, second, and third trimester. And the third trimester is when um, the fetus becomes viable outside of the uterus. Before that, it's totally dependent on the woman, on the mother, on the woman who is, should be in the picture but isn't usually, um, and some of this stuff that uh, the anti-people put out. Um, and in fact, in all of it that they put out, there's no mother there. Right. Right. Um, there's only this fetus <laughs> thing. And, and to call it a baby really violates biblical understanding legal understanding and medical understanding. It is not a baby colloquially, medically, or when you're using correct terminology. All this confabulation and mixing up of terms is just a way to confuse the issue and make it possible for people to say, you're killing your baby, which is just bullshit, okay? So, you know, you don't get a tax exemption for your, on your taxes until <laughs> the baby is born. In the Bible, it is not a baby, a living thing. A li it is not a living thing in the Bible until it breathes. And in fact, in two cases in the Old Testament, if you look back, the only time that abortion is mentioned is when specifically they're trying to determine if the wife was uh, faithful to her husband and because he owns her as property under the Old Testament laws, and that certainly went into the Judeo-Christian laws in this country, certainly before women got the vote, that, that women didn't have any legal existence outside of their husband. But the only two times that it's mentioned in the Old Testament, the priest gives, is ordered, and, and orders to be given to the woman an abortifacient to cause an abortion. And if she has an abortion, that meant that she wasn't faithful to her husband, and okay. she's an adulterer. Time's up. Oh, well, my, I have a lot of things. Okay, but there you are. I think it's, it's, it's um, confusing to talk about something that you don't understand and you cannot define and you cannot communicate clearly. Thank you, another All right. Well, it's still a potential baby. Okay. Uh, with regard, first of all, to the comments about fascism in general. And, all right. Order, please. And the idea that fascism's original language was German. Actually, it was not. It was Italian. People forget that Mussolini got in there before Hitler. Uh, most of Hitler's playbook was taken from Mussolini. And he got into power by the same means 
We've seen fascism do it in this country. Make Italy great again. Bring it up to the level of the Roman Empire. And Hitler said the same thing. Make Germany great again. Um, I don't know how many of you saw that fascinating series that ran on PBS a few weeks ago <laughs> called Dictator's Playbook. Uh, yeah. uh, I didn't see all the episodes, but I saw the ones that dealt with Mussolini, Franco, and Idi Amin. Oh, I did see that. They also covered, I believe, Manuel Noriega and one or two others. And I thought it was excellent. However, it should be noted that fascism doesn't only come into power through elections, so it certainly did with Hitler and with others. But Mussolini took power by marching on Rome and more or less shamming the king of Italy into making him prime minister. And Franco got in as a result of a civil war and the help of the Germans and the Italians. I'm next. I'm next. Um, with regard to the, to the wealthy people who backed Hitler, like Fritz Thyssen, who put him into power, Yes, they played an important role, but people forget, should forget that they thought they would control Hitler. Instead, Hitler turned out to be too powerful, and he wound up controlling them, with the result being that Fritz Thyssen wound up fleeing for his life. Uh, that doesn't necessarily make him a hero, as far as I'm concerned, since he wound up, when he came, came out of Germany, uh, having to tell how and why he gave several million marks to Hitler. Uh, with regard to, those, to the status of women in Germany, I would also say the following. You've heard the phrase, it's a man's world. Well, guys, there was nothing nice about it for women. It was a man's world with a vengeance. When women were expected to be pregnant, and if they weren't block cap, your, your local neighbor block captain came by to find out why you weren't pregnant, and if you weren't, maybe the government should take action in the matter. Uh, yes, it is. And number two, number two, with regard to um, and abortionists and gay people were executed without ceremony. Uh, with regard to the idea, and men were encouraged to, fool, at least Aryan men, who met the Nazi ideals, were encouraged to fool around and have as many relationships with women as possible. With the idea that they should bring as many children into the world as possible because Hitler needed soldiers for his future task of ruling the world, and women were important too because they could be mothers of future soldiers. Uh, with regard to abortion, I will say simply that with regard to those people who say it's unconstitutional, I trust Justice Blackman's logic more than anyone else's. Uh, with regard to Venezuela, I agree that it's hypocritical of Trump to be complaining about it. But the fact remains that, what's his name, Maduro? I think this guy's a swine and a son of a bitch and that, yeah, his own people should force him from power. I don't think it's up to us to do it. And finally, with regard to the matter of, of draftees during the war, I'm sorry, people forget that it was the draftees who won the war and defeated Hitler in Japan. It's that simple. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. I'm go mine next after you, though. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, speaking of Catholics, Loyola <laughs> Ramblers lost. They're all. No, no sister Jean this year. Anyway, um, I always thought uh, fascists were dictators. They were kind of one of the same thing. But I'm probably wrong about that. I saw something on PBS about Mussolini was the father of uh, fascism. That's where the word came from. Yeah. Italian. So he was kind of a bad guy. Um, so, you know, with abortion, I don't, you know, it's just a hard subject matter. And, uh, you know, God knows what's right about it, you know, or wrong about it. So, I, um, I really thought that the rules were all the same across the whole country in every state, but I guess they get tweaked in every state. Uh, you know, I guess there's a place for it. I don't know. It's, just, it's not a, my expertise, that's for sure. Um, one thing I wanted to say about, I was married to a Venezuelan, so, um, you know, I follow what's going on in that country pretty well. I've been there a few times. And, um, anyway, I saw something in the news about, um, it's, it sounds like Big Oil is behind this kid that's running for, uh, that's trying to take over Venezuela. Apparently, 
He's been backed by Koch brothers and other big oil concerns. So, you know, not only are we involved in six or seven other oil wars right now, now we're going to get involved in taking over a country for oil. So we'll see how that evolves. And um, as far as for our next president, I don't know about Bernie, uh, Charlie. I think this kid from this gay kid from South Bend, the mayor. I think he's gonna. And you heard it here first. I think he's gonna be the next president. He's not even 40 years old, but he seems pretty smart. And he'll stand up to Trump. Joe Biden for president. Yeah. Joe Biden. Yeah. yeah. Nobody for president. Yeah. Nobody down with the libertarians. Pence for president. Down with Pence. Pence for Get president. <laughs> but. Um, Okay, go Preckwinkle. Okay. <laughs> She's pro trains and transit. I'm next. I'm going to start the clock at this point, right about now. Hey, wait, don't I have five minutes? Yeah, you do. But oh, okay. So I've got some time. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll render my time to Tim. You have 45, 50 minutes. Don't give him any more time. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not going next year. We're going to hear about Thorium. We're going to no, hear, hear about Thorium. Go Thorium. Global. Start We've the clock. lifted people out of poverty in other countries. <laughs> <laughs> you know, men, it's time to rise up. <laughs> men. Not Feminists, women. you better beware. <laughs> because there is a movement out there. Damn thing on. It's called MGTOW. Men going their own way. Finally! And what it means, <laughs> and what it means is this. We square off relationships with women because it's too much of a hassle to deal with them. Imagine this, you get married, you have kids, and your wife after 20 years tells you, I want a divorce. You're taken to court, you get all your wealth sucked away, and all of a sudden, you're dead broke. She's got the kids and all the wealth. Is that really fair? No. Yeah. That's fake news, so, so, Tim. It's not accurate either. And the thing <laughs> is, is that uh, many... And he will never go through that because nobody would marry him. <laughs> and the thing is, most men who are like me don't think they could do it. If you want sex, just go to one of your local sex worker places and get it. Be done with it after you pay for it. And you go home and you're still set free. A woman can be somewhat of a clutch. A, a something that hangs on you. They want they want all the rights in the world, but then they don't want the responsibility. So men, go your own way. Be celibate. Get yourselves established financially. Get your future set. If you want kids, then I'm afraid you're going to have to put up with a woman. But if the women want equal rights, equal pay, let them have equal responsibility. And yes. Men can clean and cook just as good as women do. Especially if a man's in the military, he knows how to make his bed in the morning. Properly. Not with all the frif flow that a woman would have in her own bedroom. With all the extra curtains and things. So men, stand up. Men, your go time your own is way. Up, Tim. <laughs> Five minutes. Go back to Thorium. Men, men, go your own way. It's time to put the women, let them have their own things. If they want the kids, they can have them. But men, if you really want to be liberated, push the women aside. Let them deal with their equal rights. Get your own organizations running. Exclude the women from them. And if anybody wants to do anything about it, I'm just going to say, hey, there's a lot of men like me out there who want to go their own way, and uh, I think it's a good idea. Thank you. <laughs> Jeez, Tim. I wish you were right. <laughs> MGTOW. Look it up on the web. All right. All right, Charlie. All right. Um, well, first of all, you should thank yourselves for coming out on this cold and unseasonable evening, and thank you uh, to our speaker for putting together. Let's give her a hand for yeah. this presentation. Nice liver he is a shopping here. here. I'll be eclectic and usual here. I was thinking about it. I, I, I kind of personally yes, bridge two cultural periods in our nation, no. the 50s <coughs> and the 60s. Um, in the 50s and 60s, uh, 
the roles were pretty well defined of men and women, boys and girls, teenagers in particular. Um, it, they called it Happy Days, if I'm correct. They had the program. Not the ones that lived. And this didn't seem to be a torturous, yeah. evil situation. Uh, they seem to accept it. Thank you. Then you come to the 60s, and what have you got? You, you've got chaos here and, and questioning it. I had a girlfriend that she burned her bra and stuff like this, you know. Kind of things that every young girl is supposed to do. Yes. Uh, but seriously, it has changed. I'm often recollected the fact that when I was in college, um, first of all, I went to a rather a college that had both men and women. But even then, the the rule was in effect that women had to wear skirts. I just remember that. I, I had a girlfriend that wore slacks. She was kind of, you know. Yeah. Uh, but these rules were in place. It certainly has changed. Now, I always think about, and this was the, a few years ago, the evil characters in this whole, this whole situation was the white European male. We actually had an evening here at the college on the white European male. And you didn't take my question, but um, <laughs> yes, the, they were positive as being nefarious uh, conspiracy to keep everyone confined, not only women, but the rest of the world. However, if you really seriously do an inventory of the white European male, no one can equal their accomplishments. Take astronomy. All the planets, the whole subject of astronomy is, is, is attributable to them. The great books of the Western world, the musical compositions, uh, Nobel Prizes, discoveries in medicine, uh, I was doing research on the steam engine, entirely discovered by the white European male. Uh, even then, uh, now the other thing we did was compare it to other cultures. And if you take like European philosophy, and I'm sorry, I like it, I've studied Buddhism and so forth, but quite frankly, this Asian philosophy goes in circles. It, it's not comparable. Uh, you take some of the music of other cultures versus the compositions, the classical music of the West. And as one, I still like my one friend said he was to music. I played it for him. He said that hurt his ears. You know, so the the, the, the bar has been raised. Um, we certainly welcome the women. There's no similar reason. I don't know if there ever was, like, you'd have to convince me that there was an effort to confine women. That's not the way cultures work. I don't think it was a bonded situation, though certainly they, they were held in confining rules, cultural rules, but I don't know if there was a concerted effort. It's a complex subject that how these roles how societies become societies, and everybody kind of figures out what they're supposed to do. And those who don't do what you're supposed to do are punished or ostracized from it. Now the iconoclist comes along and questions those rules. Very often they get punished for doing so. So I don't know, let's just kick around a few ideas here. I'm certainly glad that the real subject here, though, is the advancement of human rights, That's right. which began after the, the war, and it incorporates many of the things Jake kind of hit on some of the United Nations issues, which is responsible for it, but the basic discussion of human rights that fortunately we've begun to look at and make assessments, corrections, and necessary adjustments. But anyhow, Get working on your one for next year. We'd like to have you back. And thank you very much.
Okay. Yeah, yeah watch out for those fascists, guys. After Randy, like we're going to let our speaker. <laughs> yeah, I'm running the country. Uh, yeah. I have a rebuttal. I like those yeah, fascists. Yeah, she has a rebuttal. Oh. We have my, five minutes, right? Yeah, my, my computer's off right, right now. It ran out of battery. I got a timer. Okay. I won't go over the time. It'll be five right. minutes. Plenty of time. We got plenty of time. Well, you can also get out a little early, too. Since our time. I'm sorry, I, I got here late and missed your talk. Right here. All right. I missed your talk tonight because I was at school with the science competition. We got out way late. But I gather it was about human rights. And women's rights. Women's rights, women's rights, right? And refuse fascism. And, and reduce fascism. Yeah. Okay. Well, a couple of comments I don't think anybody mentioned. Our country is exhibiting all 14 of the steps toward being converted into a fascist country. And they've been publishing those little pamphlets for the last 10, 12 years, you know, since Bush and Cheney took over. It really picked up when Bush and Cheney began masquerading as our president and vice president. And then Obama became a placeholder, and now we've got a corporate criminal con man who has absolutely no, Trump is number one, he has the least number of qualifications for them qualifying him to, do, to sit in that office of anybody in the history of the republic. He has the most qualifications that would cause a person to be removed from the peace and prosecuted for crimes against humanity. People are dying all over the world because Trump is continuing the fascist tendencies of the corporate billionaires who are running our country, for one thing. Another thing, people are talking about all kinds of different issues. If everybody is not familiar with the Fridays for the Future school strike that started in Europe and has gone viral, I would suggest you log on and just, uh, if you have a smart phone or a computer, look up Fridays for the Future or School Strike for Climate, where these students have not quite reached the Buddhist monk point yet, where monks were sitting down in the street and setting themselves on fire to protest the Vietnam War. But young people just generally don't want to commit suicide before all other avenues of you know, effort have been uh, exhausted. But what they're working with, the, these young people and about at least four young, relatively young congresswomen know that they are risking their lives. They're risking their lives like Martin Luther King did to speak truth to power. And speaking truth to power means telling the billionaire predators that are running our country and making oil profits, obscene profits off of drugs, medicine. They're shoveling wealth to the top. One of the, you know, most of you know I give speeches on blackout subjects. But we've never had a speaker here that talked about some books that were published back in 83 talking about how to basically eliminate the problem of abortion. You teach people how to have sex without ever risking pregnancy in the first place. You can't talk about that in American high schools. You violate the morals code. Uh, in America, the wages of sin is pregnancy and death. You're put on here to suffer as much as possible and get to the hereafter. And if you talk about having fun without making babies, well, that's, that's wildly immoral for a lot of religions. Am I right? We can see the light at the end of the tunnel now. Uh, most of us, hopefully, we're going to live through the next decade and we'll be on the pathway to total global destruction or we'll be on the pathway to uh, providing a healthy future for the kids that are here now. But you got 10, 11, 12, especially the teenagers. The teenagers that are old enough to vote, they are organizing a worldwide Fridays for a future movement where they take one day off from school and go find their representatives and clog their offices. The, the group called Extinction Rebellion was formed in the UK. And, and they shut down London by clogging all the roads one day. Uh, a couple days later, uh, they shut down all the bridges. 
massive, massive protests. We're talking about 20, 30, 40,000 people at a time in these protests. And there's there's dozens of sites all over the United States that are, are divided, designated right now as massive protests. We don't know how big because it's growing every day as more and more schools are signing on. For this coming Friday, the 15th, school strike for climate globally. And 2030, 10 years from now, is the last opportunity we have to get off fossil fuel. That's what they're talking about. And the science is very, very, very solid. So if we want to give the kids a decent future, we have to have a World War II type mobilization. And are you familiar with the author Naomi Klein? You know who she is? She's published a book called This Changes Everything. And she's talking about changing the economic system so that there is fairness and justice human rights, women rights for everybody. I would er, talk, ask people to just look at Norway and what some of those uh, Scandinavian countries are doing for women's rights. It's a totally different ballgame than what we have in America. So there's a tremendous amount of hope out there, but our press, our mainstream press, doesn't cover it. It maintains people in a bubble of mythology. That's all. That's all I have to say. Let's okay. Go. But thank, thank you for coming. I'm sorry. I'm gonna say a few words. <laughs> all right. You get a chance to rebut. Rebutters. You're the last speaker up there. Just a few. So go ahead. <laughs> sorry. You got the full microphone and our full attention. Yeah. If you notice, right after the war. They never arrested crop. Never arrested. Yeah, I G Farben. They made the chemicals that put people in the ovens. And they never arrested the bankers there. And right after the war, what happened? John Foster Dulles, who was a banker, went back to Germany. Why? He had interests in Germany, and he collected a lot of money there. So the bankers and the industrialists are the ones that causes fascism. Anybody that doesn't that knows anything about history knows that's what it is. No, he just jumped. All right, let's get our speaker up there. Get our speaker up there, Mr. Speaker. Mrs. Um, speaker. This was uh, thank you, everyone, for hearing, um, for listening, uh, for debating. I thought the the spirit was very good, even when we disagreed. Um, I. I want to echo what Jonathan was saying. The situation, and what the last speaker just said, the situation that we are facing is so dire, is so urgent. People are dying around the world now. And this Trump and Pence regime is only fueling that direction. Um, the climate crisis is a, a, a great example, and only one, that the whole Earth depends upon. This is someone who gets up in front of the UN and threatens to blow a whole country away with nuclear weapons. And if you don't believe him, then you're the delusional one. That this could happen, and then what is that gonna unleash? We cannot, the premise of refused fascism is twofold. One I talked about tonight, fascist regimes come to power often, not always, but often through elections that legitimizes them and their whole purpose is do away with the ability to have elections. They are doing it in front of our faces. And people say, well, how do you know what he's going to do next? Yeah. Listen to him. Mm -hmm. He is telling us th that he cannot lose in 2020 unless it's a fraud. And they control the, the um, levers of power to um, declare it a fraud. So those of us who think that through those normal processes we are going to end this fascist regime, we are fooling ourselves at exactly this time of urgency where we have to look the situation in the face, not be content with all of what we grew up with, all of our assumptions or whatever. That's why I'm going to e emphasize again, look into this. Join us next, uh, two weeks from today on March 23rd, where we will join these questions much more deeply. Because speaking here for Refuse Fascism, there is a way out. It is massive nonviolent protest. It's happened. The South Korean people removed their corrupt president who had been elected. Their legislature said, no, no, no grounds for impeachment. 
People came out weekend after weekend, Friday night, Saturday night, growing in numbers from 10,000 to 100,000 to millions of people, and then suddenly they discovered there were grounds for impeachment, and she was gone, and in came the most liberal president they had had in decades, and that was the beginning of a certain rapprochement yeah. with North Korea. It's happened, that was three years ago. It happened in Slovakia, the people did that. Um, it's, it's, I, I can't even, um, let's see. I'm sorry, I can't remember, but there's several countries just within the last few years that have done that. Um, and I like to point out, Martha Luther King never uh, uh, campaigned for anybody. That movement changed this country, not through elections, but by mobilizing the people. We don't have that time today. Again, uh, as John said, we have to come together to stop this. And, and there is a way, again, please refuse fascism.org, go to the website, check it out, sign the um, call to action, read it, if that makes sense, sign it. Uh, come next uh, March 23rd, become part of this movement. There's room for everybody, there's something for everyone to do uh, to, to further this cause, so thank you. Okay, you want a camera, Michelle, Andy? Oh, I'm good. You're good? Okay. All right, camera, Michelle, Andy. Yeah, I'm in. When her friends had a revolution and took over, and it was okay, a woman that, that was in the wanted? College of the Conduct. All right, Heather. Heather. Let us Let me speak into the camera here. Thank you all for coming, and we're gaveled out tonight. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Let's give Andy applause. Thank you. If anybody didn't get a flyer, I want you to do.